Uh, you have to you have to take it over now. You are in in Utrecht at, at the lab. Uh, to, to I'm start. Uh, in a lab indeed. I'm wearing my chemical protection glasses. So um, yeah, I'm in a lab with uh, Bas der Lingen, and Bas is a PhD student candidate, I must say, for the CVBC consortium. And he's doing research and developing catalysts. They look like this. It looks like baking powder, but it is definitely <laughs> something else. Catalysts <laughs> for making uh, yeah, sustainable uh, chemical building blocks. Bas, can you explain a little bit about that? What is, what is this, what we have here? Yeah, I'm not sure if everybody knows what a catalyst is, but the catalyst is, uh, yeah, in this case, it's a powder. And this powder uh, we use to uh, accelerate the reaction. So we can, for instance, make a certain product or we can lower the reaction temperature. And this, of course, all has to do with uh, making more efficient use of feedstock and also energy. Yeah. And what kind of feedstock are you uh, currently working on? So my project uh, is about using methane as a feedstock. And in this case, we have an additional advantage, and that is that we also apply a byproduct, which is hydrogen chloride. And we try to make uh, chemical building blocks for the production of plastics and, for instance, also uh, fuels. So you try to convert methane into? Into? Into chloromethane. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. <laughs> and you do that in this? So we do this in the, instead of... You can see it here. I hope everybody can see it. I will open the, uh, the window for a second. Um, so. There are a few components, but the most important part of your setup is, is this thing here, and this is the oven. And in the oven, we have a tube like this situated. Um, so the oven, we need to, uh, to heat up our catalyst. So this reaction occurs at around 450 degrees. And on top, the, the gas is flowing. So we have our methane, we have oxygen, and we have hydrogen chloride. And at the bottom, the products flow out. And we analyze these products with a uh, apparatus that is called a GC. So we can determine how active is the catalyst, what products, products do we make. And uh, what is very unique about these setups is that we also have uh, the ability to study the catalyst in, in the reaction. So for instance, here I have a, it's called a UV vis probe. So this is actually uh, a glass fiber mm -hmm. and we can send uh, UV light in into the reactor. And what it does is with this, we can characterize the catalyst under working conditions. So okay. we call this operando spectroscopy. Yeah. And this enables us to, for instance, if we see that the catalyst deactivates, so we see that the activity drops, we can then also see if the catalyst is also changing. So in this way, we can correlate the activity that we observe to the, let's say, structural information that we get with uh, applying light. Right. Hey, and and what, uh, what kind of uh, applications do we have to think of with this? You mean in terms of products? Yeah. Um, so, for instance, uh, you can make... Um, so, chloromethane, you can convert further to, uh, for instance, ethylene. Yeah. Uh, which is, of course, a very uh, important product because you can make polyethylene. Which yeah. Which is a uh, very, uh, very yeah, common plastic that we apply. Nice. I'm going back to the first position that we had. Um, <clears throat> hey, uh, boss. So uh, you're part of this consortium of uh, like really, uh, let's say, yeah, uh, companies that have a whole history. Um, you're on the verge of starting your career, yes. right? Yeah. Um, now, yesterday I heard an interesting remark by uh, Luke. I don't know his last name anymore, but Luke, who works for Life, he said, like, the new generation, and we can say you're part of the new generation, so to say. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, doesn't want to work anymore for, like, the, the let's say, the, the, yeah, the old economic system. They don't care about, like, uh, a lot of money, good contracts. Uh, is that something that you recognize? It's, I mean, the, the next generation wants to work for like the good purpose, like the, the yeah, like we were talking about these two days. Is that something that you recognize? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, to be to be honest, I think uh, contributing to to this um, how to say uh, transition, this entire transition is yeah. important as a chemist. Yeah. I think we have to 
we have to make a difference, and especially if you're in a situation like like us, where we make catalysts, which are very important for this transition. Then I have to do. I also have to contribute to this uh, to this problem that we face. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's very important. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, um, on top of that, I don't know if I am not going to experience that, but not, maybe you, maybe not. Twenty one hundred. What does the world look like? I hope much greener, but <laughs> <laughs> let's yeah. see it too in the air. It would be nice. <laughs> now it would be a little bit more concrete. Where in 2100, we are behind, uh, beyond, I have to say, beyond the whole transition. What does okay. the world look like in terms of this uh, transition? Where are we then? Um, I think at that point, we have to make sure that everything is a closed loop. So not only, for instance, CO2 and methane, but all all other kinds of stuff. Yeah. So for instance, the waste that we produce, uh, metals and whatever, batteries, solar panels, all that kind of stuff also needs to be, uh, let's say, closed loop so we yeah. can reuse these materials. Yeah, it's 100% circularity. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah, I think any more fossil fuels then? Uh, renewable fossil fuels. Renewable fossil fuels. Yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah. CO2 okay. based, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think, we can still apply fossil fossil fuels, but they need to be from a sustainable resource, right? Absolutely. They need to be at least a carbon neutral. So. Yeah. 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 Oh, very nice. Are there any uh, questions for Bas from uh, the table? I, I can imagine there are, there are uh, Bob. Uh, so thanks, uh, Bas, for your for a really interesting uh, story and showcase uh, what you what you've shown us there at the lab uh, in in Utrecht. Um, dear table, any questions? What do you want to know? From uh, from Bas, and maybe who's got a job offer for him? <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of old technology, old companies are represented here at the table. But well, <laughs> Bas was talking about making a difference, making a contribution as a chemist. And personally, I think uh, Bas that wherever you will work as a chemist, you will make a contribution to uh, to uh, the solutions for the problems the world is facing uh, today. And maybe you can do that as well with one of the larger companies who have the manpower and uh, the funds to, to, to do it at a large scale. But that's up to you, it's your own career. But let's see at the table if there are questions for you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, Bas, thank you very much. I think it's very nice to see that next to the energy transition, indeed the materials transition also has to happen to make the world, as you mentioned it, uh, completely recycle bar. Uh, one of the things I saw is that your catalyst is produced under 400, 450 degrees you mentioned. That seems to be a lot of energy. Uh, do you expect that that can be a lower te temperature? Because I can imagine there is a lot of energy and therefore come a footprint to be gained if you can lower the temperature. Uh, good question. Um, but it's very interesting actually this that we call this uh, conversion uh, of methane over, so this reaction is called oxychlorination reaction. And what they state in literature is that 450 degrees is mild conditions. <laughs> so for instance, if you look at oxidative coupling of methane in which you have uh, only methane and oxygen to produce also, for instance, ethane and ethylene, uh, you need temperatures of 700, 800 degrees, which is much higher than 450. On the other side, if you can make better catalyst and we can lower this energy, then of course it, was, it would be very beneficial. But um, it's always a balance between um, what can you technically achieve and what is, yeah, what is good enough to make a process, right? Yeah. So, but what you technically can achieve is only what you can technically achieve today. That doesn't mean that that is what you can techni technically achieve tomorrow. That is what you are doing, of course. Yes. But we also have thermodynamic limitations, kinetic limitations. <laughs> Don't fight that. The laws of physics. Earlier. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, so we also need a certain reaction rate. Um, yeah. You can put more catalysts in, you can lower the temperature, but that also, um, yeah, then you also need to have bigger reactors and that, yeah, you have more loss. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's always a balance. But yeah. making better catalysts is, I would say, the first step to a better process. Yeah, good. All right. Another question. Cool. Yeah. So, so in this case, and maybe a little bit to the question that Andre just asked, so you're putting the energy in this case in by heat, eh? so you have to heat it relatively high uh, up in uh, tem temperature. We hear here a lot about other energy sources, like maybe doing electrocatalysis or doing uh, photo-induced catalysis, uh, other ways of getting the energy into the reactor. Could you imagine 
for your reaction or maybe for associated reactions that you could do that also? Well, I think that's a difficult question. I don't know if it is possible to heat large reactors with electricity. Um, to that, I don't know the answer, to be honest. Um, I think, so we apply here methane, uh, which you can also burn. So if you can yeah. make that renewable, then it would also be better, I would say. But uh, electrically heating would be, would be much better. But yeah. I can imagine that you also need a smaller um, diameter of your reactor to have efficient heating. Yeah, but the future bus is will be also heating with uh, electricity, uh, also in industrial industrial processes, doesn't it? Because uh, we what we see steam crackers powered by electricity in the future. I know it's uh, it, you need a lot of it, but it is possible. If it is possible, I would I would say go for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good to hear.